We're good? Okay. Yeah, so from my point of view, it's currently around midnight. So if I can stay awake, you should be able to stay awake. All right? <laughs> so um, unit testing by example, automatic tests is typically fun for about a day. Then it grows to a few hundred lines of code. And then your test becomes spaghetti. And then you realize at some point that you just added more work to your plate. That's how most people feel and how most bosses feel about unit testing. And this is why they don't like it. You know, and then you, you don't see the point of doing the test and the deadlines are coming and you just throw unit testing out the window. So my name is Anna Felina. I'm a developer and um, I'm a problem sol solver, a teacher and an advisor. And I come from Canada. Uh, my objectives with this presentation is to make the unit testing for you more enjoyable than it used to be, make it useful, and reduce the pre-release stress. Um, I'm going to show you examples in PHP, but the advice is also good for any other programming language as well. Uh, it's quite general. So it can be very enjoyable, in fact, and um, I often see test suites that uh, have a lot of tests, uh, but they don't do anything very useful. So we'll try to make it more meaningful, more useful, so that you see the point of writing them and you are compelled to write them. So pre-release stress, what is that? So imagine it's Friday afternoon and you have to release and then something goes terribly wrong and now you have to stay up until midnight to fix it and it's, it's very, very frustrating and then you have this feeling in your stomach that you're like, oh, I don't think I'm gonna go home anytime soon and, and now everything is exploding. Um, so it's, it's not a very nice feeling. Uh, raise your hand if you ever had to release on Friday afternoon and it didn't go well. All right, so about half of you have raised your hands. All right, so let's fix that because it's not really that much effort. Uh, it just takes a lot of practice. So yeah, you don't become an expert overnight. Don't expect to jump into unit tests and be, be an expert and know exactly where you're going with it. You have to start somewhere and build on that and progress slowly. And then in the end, you will become really good and it will make a lot of sense. And then your code will be of greater quality and you can release on any day with just one click and it's gonna go fine. So some, some of you have possibly tried to write some tests and gave up because you didn't see the advantages of them. Um, some of you maybe haven't tried, but all of you at the end, I hope that you will be able to um, to want to write some tests to try these theories out. Um, is this lagging? Okay, now it works. So you don't start with 100% coverage. Don't fool yourselves that you are gonna go there and you will write a test suite and it's gonna have 100% coverage right from the start. Um, this is what you should strive for, but it is not somewhere that you should begin. You should begin with something much smaller so that you can you can write fewer tests and then get used to them and understand how testing works and how what's the relationship between the tests and your code, and then uh, then you'll be able to uh, to move in a in a good direction and then increase the coverage because now you know that what you're writing are quality tests. Uh, so when you test without automation, it goes about like that. Um, you have you have a new feature, and then you go in and you test it. Uh, you click here, you put some input there, and it works. And then you add another feature, and then you test it manually. You try a few things, but you also have to test the other thing before it because you you don't know if what you uh, that feature that you wrote you maybe changed a little bit in one class and then it has an impact on the rest of the application. So you retest everything. And then you have another feature and another, and then you have 50 features that you have to test uh, under various conditions, and at some time it becomes a lot of work. And also, the human eye cannot see everything. It's not very precise. So say you have, um, you're fetching something from a database and you're supposed to have 65 elements on your page, like little thumbnails. But to know that there are 65, you have to count them if you're doing it manually, right? You have to count them by hand, 65. If there's 66, you might not miss it. And if some tiny change that happened in the code is now making 66 elements appear, you might not notice because you don't want to count it repeatedly. 
Um, and you can even make a mistake in counting because there's just so many. So the computer can do that for you. That's the whole point of automating is that you don't have to inspect the output visually because visually you can miss certain things. And I know it happened to me where um, I would write a test and then uh, the output, it was some JavaScript and then there was a test and it was supposed to show something on the page and it was showing something else. So the test didn't pass. I'm like, well, it's not supposed to be like that. So I go to the, to the, to the page and then I notice that it says uh, slide, I don't know, one out of not a number. So there was this mistake. And we would not have noticed it at any point because, you know, the characters are more or less similar, you know, one out of something, and our brain just fills in the rest. It's like when we read words and the letters of, are backwards. We don't really notice that the word is misspelled because our brain completes the picture. And that's the problem with our brain, and this is why we use the computer to not have this bias. So yeah, and also you're afraid to, to make changes to your code. It's like you walk on thin ice and you're afraid to breathe because if you make the wrong move, everything's going to break under you and gonna, you're going to fall through. It's going to be the end of the world. Um, so the unit tests, they give you, or just automated tests in general, they give you this confidence to move forward because you know that the, the ground you're walking on is really solid. And then as you gain confidence, it's no longer the code controlling you. It's you controlling the code, and the code does exactly as you tell it to do. And then you're not afraid to go into bigger refactoring projects and stuff like that. So it's a lot more fun. So there are many opportunities to write tests. And I will show you step by step how to spot these opportunities and what kind of tests you can write at that stage. So think of it as the four stages towards TDD. So the first and easy step is when you find the, you find the bug. So for example, um, when a user enters 0 0.1 in the quantity, uh, you are charging the customer 0 0.1 times the price, which is incorrect because it's impossible. So you're basically giving them a 90% discount. So you don't want that. Makes no sense. It, it might mess up your other systems as well. So you need to, to make sure that uh, anything that comes in is either validated or, um, re and rejected or maybe transformed in some way. So what you do is you would instantiate the cart item object with an item, which is Skyrim, the game, uh, at $30. And you set the quantity at 0 0.1. So you set it to the wrong one so that you can assert that it, it actually fails. So when you say assert equals one, uh, of get quantity because you want you want it to return one so you say what you want it to do but then the actual thing is going to fail this is the first step why because if you if if this would have passed then you would think well something else is wrong right so you have to make sure you have to confirm that this is actually a bug this is exactly what is causing the bug this is why you test the failing scenario once it fails what you do is you go to your code and you make a change. So the change you make is, and I just show you a part of the function. So when you get the, you want to set the quantity, you, uh, you apply a function to round it up to the next integer. So if you get 0 0.1, you get, you get one. If you put 2.1, you get three. So by doing this, now if you run this test, at 0 0.1, it will be equal to one in the end, right? So when 0 0.1 comes in, one comes out, and this test will pass. So this switch from failing, to, uh, failing result to uh, success result to passing result, this is what you're looking for. And you do it when you find bugs. Um, So yeah, why would you write a test for something that is so simple also is because it provides a form of documentation. So it's, it's not obvious to always um, write comments as to why you put this ceiling here. Why would you, why would you round it up? Well, that's because um, we want to make sure that whenever we put 0 0.1, we get actually one. So the, without even having any kind of comments, the test both makes sure that there's no error, but at the same time provides a form of documentation. Because then somebody will try and look for 
uh, for all the functions that test the quantity and find this, the other developer after you will find this and say, okay, that makes sense. I understand why it has been done this way. So it's also a form of communication between yourself and other developers, uh, future developers, maybe even future you. So you write some code and then a week later you forget what, why you wrote things in a certain way and this reminds you, oh right, that's because we had this bug. So not only does it remind you of why it does that, but what the bug was, which can be very useful. All right, so before we move on, let's just um, talk about some vocabulary. So what we just saw here is called regression testing. Is we make sure that the code that you run, uh, that you write today, is still going to work tomorrow, it's, it's, or rather the code that you fix today is not going to be broken tomorrow. So later, if you make any other changes to that function, you want to make sure that it keeps behaving in the same way. And the easiest way to do that is to write a test, and it's just three lines of code. So it's very straightforward. Another opportunity to, um, to test is when you are about to improve existing code, you want to make some changes to it. So like in this scenario, um, you, you want to add additional code, but you're afraid to break what is already there. So what you do is, this is the scenario, uh, you want to make the shipping free for orders over $40. So if somebody orders below that, the shipping is um, how much, $12 I think, uh, sorry, $15. And then if you are, um, if not, then you want to make sure that the shipping is free. If it's above 40 or above, then the shipping is free. So you write this, uh, you add two items, and you make sure that, um, that this test fails. It will fail because, um, sorry, in this case, it will, in this case, it will pass. So you should also write a failing test for that. But sorry, no, at first when you write this, it will fail because you haven't made the change yet. And then once you make the changes to the shipping calculation, then that will start passing. So at first, every order, um, the, sh the, the get shipping function always returns 15. But what you want is to change that behavior. So in here, it will be a failing, a failing scenario. So once again, we make sure that the shipping is zero and the get total is 60. And now we're going to change our get shipping function where we, uh, we put an if statement and we check for the subtotal. So if the subtotal is uh, less or equal than 40, uh, sorry, greater or equal than 40, return zero. So if our order is greater than this amount, free shipping. If not, the default shipping is 15. And you can add additional calculation based on the destination or the provider use or whether they want express shipping. Uh, you can add that functionality, but you'll make sure that if it's over a certain amount, it's going to be free all the time. So now, that, now if you run the same test that you've written before, it will pass. And this is what you want. So right, test both cases, so not just the free shipping, but also test the other case where the shipping is not free. Because if you make a mistake, of course it's a simple example just to illustrate uh, how it works, but in some more complex code, you might make a mistake and give free shipping to everyone. So that even if the person orders for $1, you'll still give free shipping, so you're losing a lot of money. Uh, so to avoid that, make sure that um, you add another test where you, make, you test for something that is below 30. So the quantity is one, so one times 30 is 30. So the shipping will be 15 and the total will be 45, which is 30 plus the shipping. So, so yeah, the, the idea is to, to test both scenarios because we have an if statement, and I'll explain that a bit later, uh, why this is important. So we learn how to write tests after most of your code is implemented, which is pretty straightforward, and it's probably something you will do when you come into a project and you see no tests. You will have to write them. But once this is done, and you start writing completely new code, while you write the code, you can also write the test, so simultaneously. So what you do, for example, if you are writing a get total function and you want to start applying taxes, so you start adding this, these taxes, and usually you would, um, after you have gotten your applicable taxes, you might want to uh, 
output the content of the taxes array. What does it contain? To make sure that everything else is, is not going to fail because of the wrong, um, wrong array. So you do an output and you inspect the content, uh, which would look something like that. So this is a, a, a var dump of, of that taxes array, and it contains basically two elements, and each element contains a name uh, for the tax that will appear on the invoice and the percentage. So in Quebec, we have two taxes. We have the federal tax that is applied, which is 5%, and then we have the provincial tax applied in addition to that, which is 9.975%, which is a weird number, but this is how we are. <laughs> it was, it's actually a funny story because it, it used to be compound um, in the sense that at first they would take the subtotal and then add the first tax and then take all of that and then apply the other tax, which is like a tax on a tax. But then they, they realized that all the software uh, is having trouble supporting those, you know, different taxes where in most, like pretty much everywhere in the wor world it doesn't exist and just in Quebec. So they decided that to make life easier for e-commerce in Quebec, they decided let's just, let's just change the value of this instead. So it used to be, I think, 9.095, so 9.5%. Um, and then they just changed it so that it, the total is still the same, but at least it's, you no longer need to compound. You just take the subtotal, multiply by this, subtotal, multiply by this, and then everything together will give you the total. So here's a little bit of tax history in Quebec. So when you write the code, instead of doing this output, so I'll just bring you back to this output. The problem with this is you are once again visually with your eye inspecting this and making a, a, an assertion. You're saying, okay, this looks good but you are the one saying that this looks good. Maybe it's not good, right? Maybe, uh, for example, say there's no zero here. So what happens? So it's 0 0.9975. That's a problem because you might not notice it with your eyes, but if you tell the computer to look for that value, the computer will tell you, no, this is wrong. You don't have the right value. And it's, very, it's a very easy mistake to make. I made this mistake once. So what we do here now is we instantiate a new cart, we get all the applicable taxes for this customer, and we assert the internal type that it's an array, it's not a null, it's not a, an object or anything else, so that all the subsequent operations will not fail. And then we make sure that it contains two elements. We grab the first tax, the first element, and we assert that it's equal to 0 0.05. This is useful. Right, and so if it's anything else, then it will fail. So now, now you have that. Uh, the advantages of this approach is that, you know, these tricks I showed you that you can use while writing, after writing code and while writing the code, it allows you to write more tests very quickly because they're so obvious. Basically, whenever you are compelled to output uh, the, the content of an array or like just output a value to your screen or to your log, instead, create a test. So that's the rule of thumb. Whenever you are about to do this, instead write a test, uh, and that will remain forever so that later if it breaks, you don't have to, to do the same var dump. You don't have to output the same value all the time and inspect it visually. And if under certain scenarios you might have, well, maybe for taxes that's pretty simple, there's maybe two or three, but for other things you might have 20 elements and you have to look at them every single time and it's very time consuming. So writing this test, which um, maybe without practice takes 20 minutes, but with enough practice maybe takes 20 seconds. And with those 20 seconds, you'll be saving a lot more because those tests, you will be executing them once, you know, one, two, three times per maybe per minute because you can hook your, um, your test suite into the saving mechanism of your uh, editor. And then every time you save any file, you can rerun your entire test suite, which is pretty quick. So you can, you can write more tests. Uh, they will become very easy to write. And you will never, fa never fall too far. 
Well, why am I saying this? Imagine that if you are uh, climbing a mountain and there's always a risk that you will fall and you will die. So what the climbers do, they plant a little anchor, and then they put their rope through it. And this way, if they ever lose their grip, they're only going to fall as far as the last anchor. And these are what regression tests are. It's basically you're planting an anchor. So you know that you will never fall below that point because the test will indicate the second anything is wrong. So, and you just keep building them. So as you go forward, you build your tests, you build your tests. That's how you progress. So now you know how to test while you code, but how about writing it before? Is it even possible? How does it even make sense? Uh, it, will, it will be difficult at first. Um, you will have to follow these three steps before you get into the fourth step, which is testing before, so that you can get enough practice and understanding of how tests work and what makes a test useful. And also how to write them effectively, you know, not writing too many tests either, because there is such a thing as writing too many tests that are meaningless. Um, I, thought, I think I saw a tweet once, yay, all my getters and setters are tested, um, I'm done. But you know, testing a getter and a setter means nothing because there, there is no business logic in there. So what we do, here is one example. Let's say you want to parse some data from a CSV. It happens all the time. Say so you're building your online store and now you're almost done with your project and then the client says, well, instead of putting all our products one by one through the interface, let's just, I have this spreadsheet, I can export it in a CSV and then we can dump it into our database. So now you have to write this parser. And you have, uh, you have to you know, import the data, read the data, uh, parse, validate, make sure that there's no inconsistencies, and then um, store it into the database. But how are you going to read that CSV? Is it going to be, so in PHP we have file get contents. Is that the function we'll use? I don't know. And the thing is with TDD is that you don't have to make that decision right now. You can postpone that, that decision until later. I'll show you how. So all you know is that you have a file name and that you want to have an array that contains certain, certain items at the end. That, that's what the parser is supposed to do. So the catalog import or catalog parser, uh, what you do is you instantiate it and you parse from CSV. In which method the parse from CSV is going to read the file doesn't matter. Is it even a file? We don't know. Maybe it's a database record that is, and this is the key. It really doesn't matter. You can, you can abstract that. You don't have to think about that. What you have to think about is how it's supposed to work. All you possess right now is a file name and what you want from, from that function, parse from CSV, you want to have an array of products and you have to, it to contain two products and you want the products to have a name and a price. So you want to make sure that there's no nulls in there, that the keys exist, there's no, um, Possibly you can even test for the values, make sure that the, they're not empty. So you can do all that. And by doing it this way, you, en you will end up with more elegant code. Because at first you're going to run it, it's going to explode because the class doesn't exist. Okay, so you write the class and you write the function signature. And then you just return null in the signature. And then your assertion is gonna, are gonna, going to start to fail. So now you're like, okay, well, I already have my class and then I'm going to start writing things in there. I'm going to possibly open this file and parse it and then get it into, uh, into this array. And then as you progress, so you will create your CSV, you'll have to set up the infrastructure for this test to pass. You'll have to write the necessary amount of code for these tests to be positive. And once these tests are positive, you're done. That's the great thing. So it will, it forces you to think about the interface. So the interface is the input and the output, not about the implementation. And you worry about the implementation, you do the minimum amount of implementation, the minimum lines of code necessary for this to pass. So you are writing less code, which is more structured, more elegant, because you are testing all of your functions separately. So if one function fails, you'll know that it's precisely this function and not 10 steps down the road. 
Because what happens often is that you have an error here, but it's not because of this here. It's because the input that was provided is garbage because this function is not working right. Or maybe this function was called by another function which didn't do some, something properly. Right? So by isolating all these functions and testing them completely separately, you can achieve that. And I won't get into the whole concept of mocks, but if you want to know, look up mocks when you're ready. And the mocks will enable you to isolate things that still have dependencies. So sometimes to instantiate a class, you need to give it another object. And you can, you can abstract that by writing a mock. So that's a, that's a different topic. It's too large for this, uh, for this presentation. So yeah, and, and the thing is you won't introduce any bugs because if you write all your, all your tests in advance, you're, you don't write any bugs in the code to begin with or at least you hope so. The, this, the, the, when you say that you have no bugs, it's as far as your tests are good. So if you wrote good tests, then you will have no bugs. And sometimes it happens. It happens that you finish an application and nothing goes wrong. And it happened to me when I finished, I was writing an API and it was pretty straightforward. It's just an API. So I would you know, read data from, from a JSON input and then store it in a database and then output some stuff. And I wrote tests for that, and I gave it to the front-end developer to, um, to, develop, um, to develop an AngularJS application on top of this API. And everything was working fine. There were no bugs, and we deployed it. It took us um, six, uh, sorry, 16 weeks, no, six weeks to write the project, the entire project. And after six weeks, it was done. And it's been almost two years, not a single complaint. So it's great. So, Focus some, some more tips for you. Don't just think about how it's supposed to work. Also think about how it's not supposed to work. So I showed you earlier about um, having, you know, test, test if, you know, with 0 0.1, uh, it was pretty straightforward, but later you have uh, shipping fees. And then, okay, so we know we're supposed to have free shipping, but we're also in some cases supposed to not have free shipping. So test all cases, the positive and the negative. Uh, test what uh, test what happens if something is provided a null and so basically test for all of these exceptions that can happen so that your system will be more robust and will not uh, continue executing and then explode too late so the earlier you can you can output the error the quicker you know that the problem is because you gave me a null and then focus on realistic scenarios so as i said a getter you're not supposed to test it. So here's an example. If you say total equal five, then you shouldn't assert that it's not null because it's pretty obvious. It's not realistic that something between those two would go wrong. It could, but do you really want to spend time on that? And if you start testing all of these very obvious things, you will have thousands of tests in your suite and they will be pretty much useless and you will have to maintain them as well. Um, and it's going to be very annoying. So here's a recap of, of the different uh, steps. Is testing takes practice. You have to write tests when you see a bug. Uh, you can write tests when you are improving code. You will write tests as you are about to write new code and then even before. And make sure to test uh, unexpected behavior, um, unexpected scenarios, sorry. And the thing is, one of the obstacles to sell uh, unit tests to your boss is that it takes time. They realize that testing is something that takes time, so they will say, well, we don't have time for testing. But the thing is, do you also tell them, well, I'm going to take that much time for debugging? You don't tell, it's kind of part of the development process. Well, testing is supposed to be part of the development process. It's just that not everybody does it this way. But if you were to ship code without debugging it, it wouldn't fly. So why do we ship code without testing? It's pretty much the same. Th there are bugs, it's just that we don't know about them. So it's the same as debugging. The, the testing is actually helping us with debugging if we're um, writing the tests early enough. They help us debug. Um, so we shouldn't sell them as something separate. You should include that in your estimates. So when you estimate how much time a feature will take, estimate the time for the feature, for the performance optimization, for the tests, for the uh, debugging, all of it together.
and for the time to clarify requirements and you know all that. Uh, so yeah, and the the as a bonus, you know, once you have enough practice, um, it will be faster to write code if you have tests. So test plus code will eventually become faster than just code. So at first, test is like you're adding at, at the end or at the beginning, you add more work. But as you get really good at it, the tests are going to guide your programming so well that it's actually going to be much faster. And that's the case for me. I ship projects in four or five weeks typically now. So not months or years. That's because I test everything before I, I, I move forward. It's counterintuitive, but that's how it's supposed to work. So give them a fair chance. Now, I talked about cyclomatic complexity or how to test uh, you know, the different ifs. Because you have an if, you're supposed to write two test cases. So here's how it works. Um, here, you know, the total has to be at least 50, uh, otherwise we return. Here we only need, uh, sorry, here we need to write two tests because we have an if. Uh, because, you know, basically it means how many different paths the code could take. Because there's an if, it can take either this path or this path. There are two possible execution paths, which means that we need two unit tests for that. Okay? So, uh, cyclomatic complexity is, a, is a, a fancy word, but basically means how many paths can your code take. It's not the permutations, it's just paths. So, every if, even if it's inside the if, it's only going to add one more path. It's just mathematic. So it's useful because you now if you test with a hundred dollar sub subtotal, then if you have a subtotal of one hundred, then you're not testing the last line. It's not tested. Uh, in this case, it's pretty obvious, but just to illustrate the the thing, if you had some more logic in here, then you would not have test the whole block because you would have returned there. And if you test with something that is below fifty then you would test this part, but not what's inside. This code would have been left untested. And there are tools that allow you to see which paths have been taken and whether everything has been covered by the, by the test. This is called code coverage. So each decision you make, either it's a loop or an if, uh, it adds additional execution paths. So this is just a diagram, very fancy. So loop is a, is a decision branch, but why? How is it a decision? Well, it has to break at some point, right? So there is a, an implicit if. There's an if inside of it that you don't see, but it actually executes, and then at some point it has to decide that it has to stop. So to test if, what I do is I typically write two tests, one with zero items to loop uh, or zero iterations, and one with multiple iterations. And I'll show you. So here we have a bug, okay? So the, consider this code. Uh, you have a product loop in which you're adding to the total. Well, you later check for that total, and because we didn't, you know, this will throw you a notice because total has not been, if you have zero products, then the total would not have been defined, and then total doesn't exist here. So in PHP, unless you, you put total equal to something, it's not defined. So it's going to throw you a notice, and then you, if you try to use that somewhere else in calculations, um, there's a potential for failure. So you write that. So let's fix it. And I have, sorry, I have a blank slide for some reason. So let's fix it. We put a total equals zero. So now if you, we write a test with zero product, with no products at all, an empty array, this is now going to work. Well, so you think. Because if you try it with only one product, you'll still have a bug here. And you may have not have noticed, but it's total equal. So when you loop, you don't actually add to it. You just keep reassigning it. Okay, so it's an easy one to miss, and you would know. And if you test with one product, you're going to get a false positive. It's going to tell you, yeah, sure, it works. The, your product price was you know, 30, and the quantity was 1. So yeah, sure, it's, the total is 30. Great. Great job. You're done. No, no, but if you have a, uh, two products like that, then the total should have been 60, but it's not. So that's why you have to write with multiple items so that you can iterate multiple times to avoid problems such as this and other similar issues. So yeah, to be bulletproof, you need a test for zero products and another test for 
multiple products. And that's it. Uh, my name is Anna Felina again. I do PHP, JavaScript, and other development. I fix uh, bugs and perform opt uh, I do performance optimization, uh, workshops on testing, Symfony, AngularJS, APIs, and I advise on testing strategy, and I do a lot of legacy code. And do you have any questions? I will tweet the slides, by the way. Any questions? Yeah, I have one slight question, which is not 100% uh, uh, related to the talk right now. But, okay. Um, yeah, we know we all should do like testing, and uh, I think everybody will do it. Um, but how about uh, getting to, uh, to the, the best practices of testing? For example, there was like I read or somebody told me or whatever that you only have one assert in every test. What do you think? Is this a good practice or is it a not so well practice? Okay, so the question was whether uh, it's good practice to have one assertion or is it okay to have multiple assertions in a single test case? Um, I would like to do that, you know, just one assertion, but I could never practically get that to work because then I would have to re instantiate my object repeatedly so that I can test, well, is this an array? Well, if it's an array, then is this that? Like in case of an array, I don't want this. And I can, I can see right away, okay, it's not an array, so I fix it. Yeah, the same test, I'll have to run it again to see if it passes, but I'm running my entire test suite anyway. So for me, it's not a big issue. It's just that you shouldn't have to test too many things. You, sh you have to test basically one execution path, and that should be good enough, at least from my point of view. Yeah, which, which brings me to path coverage. If you have path coverage or if you have instruction coverage, and C2 uh, from verification, I guess, uh, coverages. Um, does uh, writing tests like this um, cover, for example, two conditions with, let's say, two ifs, which would lead to four tests? Or, you know, if they, if they why each other somehow, you know? If, like, if we have a code execution path, there's one if, and then, it calls the other one, the other if, so, which means we have at least four combinations of possible paths. Okay. So, we write so, so the question is, so the question is, if we have uh, nested ifs, would we write four test cases because we have four permutations? And it's not permutations. I know it's not intuitive, but mathematically, it's really just two paths, uh, three paths. Sorry, one. All right, so if we go to Wikipedia on cyclomatic complexity, it says pretty clearly exactly how the, how the number of tests relate to the, um, to the number of uh, paths and how to calculate the paths. There's a formula there you can use, and you can literally just count your ifs and, and such and apply the formula and get the result. Okay, um, so the question was whether you would test in terms of, you know, whether it's an integer and such, or uh, what's the content? Right. Right, the, so, so the question is whether we're testing the actual contents or are we testing in terms of computer science. I would say that you should strive for the computer science, except when it touches numbers, then you have to make sure that the calculations are proper. Uh, or sometimes it can be things are not truncated. The, whether it's Skyrim or something else in the string, it doesn't really matter. But it allows you to know that it is the one that you provided here. Basically, it's a way for you to, if you have 
uh, a certain items that you are sorting and then you want to make sure that the first one is the one that you expect, then basically the, the, the string that I put there identifies that this is the one. Right, so yes, so basically we'll, we're confirming that yes, um, the, the, because we can have different orders, we have to make sure that things, if order matters, then yes, we would test that this is, uh, this is the right thing that we're getting here, um, this is the right string and not the other one, so if it were Skyrim or Diablo, then it's not Diablo that appears on top, it's, it's really Skyrim. Yes. So now you know what I play. <laughs> Is there a question in the back? No? Sorry, could you repeat more loudly? Uh, so circumstances, whether I would consider circumstances to remove assertions? Um, well, I wouldn't write them in the first place, really, I guess. If I'm... Well, I guess it's a, it's a... I don't know, I really don't know the answer. Maybe we can discuss some more uh, practical scenarios and then I can better understand the situation. It's, it's hard for me to, to imagine. Anyone else? Yes? Right, so the, the question is uh, if the boss wouldn't sanction a four month uh, testing period, then how would a company go about introducing unit tests? And just introduce them gradually, I would say. Uh, whenever you try to do a big like rush and try to do that all at once, it's quite difficult because then you're just writing tests and you're not writing something that the client really thinks the client wants. The client wants quality, of course, but the client doesn't realize because they, they have, you know, schedules uh, and deadlines. Um, they want to generate value. They want to conquer new markets. And I can totally understand that. So they might, not everybody also understands the concept of technical debt, which is a completely other topic. But the idea is that you can, you can go slowly. Well, actually, yeah, like a debt, say you want to buy a house, but you wouldn't want to wait 25 years to amass all the money so that then you can go and buy, buy the house. You would want to live in the house right now. So for the sake of the client, basically you can uh, give the client what they want, which is features, but at the same time try to introduce a little bit. So make your monthly payments uh, towards that, those unit tests, towards that debt, to reduce it progressively. And eventually, if you are able to produce tests faster than you are producing code, um, then you will eventually cover not only the new code that you write, but also the old one. You'll keep adding more and more and more, and eventually it will be all paid. It's a long-term process, but it's a good way to do that. Uh, because, you know, arguing about it and having to explain technical debt is can be a challenge, so I can understand why doing it this way would make sense. Oh, so what is on the picture? Um, yeah, well, it's automation, right? So this is like a robot putting stuff. I'm not sure. It's a stock photo, so I'm not sure exactly what these things are, but... Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, it looks like it could be shells. <laughs> Yeah, I, I never really thought about it. It just looked like, um, so I was, I had a big project with a, a factory for automating their, um, not automating the test, but also automating their test. We wanted to improve their, um, 
their processes. So we wrote an intranet to, to simplify things and make everything more automatic, you know, tracking progress and, uh, and such. And so when I think automation, I always think about those machines because they had this robot that would cut a piece of metal precisely. And I just thought it was really cool. So yeah, this is my association with automation. <laughs> Factories. Yes, any other questions? You're still awake. Yes. Okay, so do I know something to test uh, jQuery? I haven't been doing much uh, front-end testing. Um, I've, I'm thinking about getting into it, but I heard about things like, uh, so if you're doing AngularJS, there's Karma and Jasmine. Uh, there's also Casper.js, I believe, is for JavaScript in general. Uh, so yeah, look at look at those and see whether they they are suitable for what you're doing. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you and have a good evening. <laughs> <laughs>